In today's video, I want to discuss what's known as the, the path of effacement. This way of getting out from under our ordinary and, and unskillful sense of self through a practice actually of kindness, which is quite interesting in the early suttas. I'm Doug Smith of the Online Dharma Institute, that's onlinedharma.org, where you can find uh, videos of courses about the early Buddhist Dharma. If you're new to this channel and interested in living a wiser and a kinder and a calmer life, consider subscribing to this channel and click the bell down below if you want to receive notifications when I come out with new videos. Now this path of effacement, well, the problem here, the, the, the base problem, perhaps the base problem in all of Buddhism, is this problem of the unskillful sense of self, this unskillful sense of I, of who I am. And so much of Buddhist practice is involved with effacing or uh, undoing this sense of self, this uh, unskillful sense of self, and replacing it with a much more skillful and liquid sense of who we really are. And that's what we're going to get to here, uh, because there's one early sutta where the, the Buddha discusses just such a path of effacement, which seems to, the, the discussion here is with a particular monastic, but the, the background seems to be that this monastic is representing a whole bunch of other people who are not practicing very well. Now this I, this sense of self in Buddhism, is, is tied up intimately in views and opinions, and our, our own views about self, about who we are. And oftentimes when we begin a, a path like this, when we're getting underway on a particular kind of spiritual endeavor or trying to find out some philosophical thing, we begin with questions, lots of questions and theories and proposals about who we really are, about our essential self, about our true nature, about questions about whether we will persist into the future, whether we'll persist into the next lifetime, whether we've ever existed before, what the nature of the universe as well, whether the universe is infinite or finite, whether uh, it was created or not created. All these kinds of questions uh, invite us to come up with theories. And all of us are quite capable of coming up with an infinite number of such theories. And this gets us into all kinds of trouble. It gets us into arguments, into disputes, disagreements, into uh, forms of conceit, where we think of ourselves as superior to others because we think of our theories as correct and the other people as wrong. We may think of ourselves as smarter, or frankly, as not as smart sometimes. And it seems that these kinds of debates and disputes were going on a lot in the early Sangha, as we might expect. And in this sutta that I'm referring to, uh, there's a monk named Chunda, or Mahachunda, who goes, who goes up to the Buddha and asks him about all of this. And in particular, he's asking about a path of effacement, of, of wearing away this unhelpful notion of self that we have. And the Buddha responds essentially by saying that there are different kinds of practices here. And some of them are good at effacement, and some of them are not. And the Buddha says that in a general sense, it's getting to know questions about non-self that are truly useful to our effacement of this sense of self. Now, he doesn't actually in this sutta go on to discuss all of the kinds of non-self theorizing that he does, I have, in fact, a playlist on that very topic, and I'll put a link to that playlist down below if you want to know more. But the Buddha's going to, uh, I think, come at the problem from a slightly different angle in this sutta we're discussing. In fact, what the, what the Buddha ends up doing is basically to compare two different approaches to this problem of self-effacement. We might call them coming at them with a practice of calm, samadhi, of uh, meditative calm, or coming at them from a, a more practical kind of bent, a practical kind of bent that will allow us a deeper insight into the problem of non-self. He's basically comparing these two kinds of practices and opting for the second, uh, which is 
again, I've done, I've done separate videos also on this question about um, the, the usefulness of, of calming meditation to uh, get us towards enlightenment. And it's clear that at least in this sutta, he is saying that calming is not really enough. Uh, it appears that there were people who were practicing this kind of meditation and were not really getting on the right path. Now, we also have to say that this is one sutta. Uh, the sutta, this, this sutta involves the, the Buddha talking to one particular monastic who appears to be re representing a whole bunch of other people. And, you know, it depends on the situation. There may be other situations where the Buddha would have answered the question differently. In any event, the Buddha says that these monastics, they're practicing deep kinds of calming meditation. They're getting into what are the states that are called the jhanas. That is, states of deep meditative absorption, uh, very pleasant states of meditative absorption. Or they're getting into what are called the uh, formless attainments, which are arguably even deeper states of meditative absorption uh, that the Buddha actually learned uh, from pre-Buddhist teachers. And in all of these cases, what the Buddha says is these monastics are not practicing effacement. They're not involved in a practice of self-effacement. What they're involved in is a kind of a pleasant abiding in the present life, a, pre a pleasant abiding here and now. And there's nothing wrong with that. Indeed, the Buddha himself spent a lot of his time in just such states. And they do have their uses now, for many, many reasons, which I won't get into here, but these practices are indeed extremely useful. The only thing is that they don't efface away our ordinary sense of self. So I think what we may be seeing here, or at least arguably may be seeing, is a group of monastics who are extremely capable at reaching deep states of meditation. However, when they come out of those states back into their ordinary life, they then get caught up in arguments and disputes about perhaps the nature of these states, about the nature of the self, about who is better than who at, at attaining these states, and so on and so forth. And so what they're doing is practicing well to in a certain way, but they're not practicing in a way that really gets them towards the important parts of enlightenment. They're not really giving up on the sense of self. Instead, they're reifying their sense of self by clinging to views and opinions about these things. On the other hand, the Buddha says that true effacement involves the gradual wearing away of our defilements, in particular of greed, of hatred, and of our delusions about the self. So to that end, uh, the Buddha recommends a, a list of practices. Now, the recent scholar, uh, great scholar of early, the early tradition, uh, Analio, Bhikkhu Analio, has done a comparison of various uh, recensions of this text in various languages and finds that the list of practices is different in, in each of these. Uh, some of them are shorter and some of them are longer. And so the precise practices don't need to uh, 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 detain us too much here because Again, we don't really know exactly which ones are, are in the list, but the main point is, is the same in all of these texts, which is a practice of kindness, of non-harming, a practice of ethics, of, of not killing, not stealing, the kinds of things that we have heard of before, of being kind to one another. And more than that, the Buddha recommends in these texts that we even when we're surrounded by other people who are behaving improperly, that we should not do so ourselves. That is, even when we're surrounded by people who are harming each other or getting into uh, arguments and disputes and hatred and involving themselves in conceit about their own abilities, we should make the determination, the intention not to do so ourselves. And this intention to refrain from harming others, to refrain from unkindness, will in time, the Buddha says, wear away our defilements. It'll wear away our greed to be always right in an argument, let's say. It'll wear away our hatred for others who disagree with us and who do things differently. It'll wear away our conceit at thinking of ourselves as better or as worse than other people or as or is the same, as I mentioned in a recent video. I'll leave a link to that one also down below. Uh, 
we will inevitably be surrounded by people who act unskillfully. And the secret here is to avoid copycatting them, to avoid being sucked into doing the same thing that they're doing. And in this way, the practice of self-effacement, the practice of effacement, is a practice of kindness, of non-harming. And this practice, I think, can also be seen as a practice that involves, essentially, aspects of right view, of understanding the right way forward, aspects of right effort, of making an effort to continue to make ourselves more skillful as we move forward, and to try to denourish those tendencies in us that are unskillful. And right mindfulness, this ability we have to keep an eye out over our own mind and our own body and our own behavior so that we uh, ordinarily will help refrain ourselves from doing things that are unskillful for ourselves and for others. And these three aspects of practice, of right view, right effort, and right mindfulness, are no, are, I've discussed as the three-stroke engine that keeps our practice going. This is something that was elucidate, elucidated in another early Buddhist text that I mentioned in an earlier video, and I'll leave a link to that video up here on the screen if you haven't seen it. If you're getting something out of these videos, I recommend taking a look over at my Patreon page. It's linked down below where you can help support the channel and get something in return for that. Thanks so much, and we'll catch you on the next video. And meanwhile, all of you, be well.